God. Help me to celebrate this choir. Hallelujah. I've got the victory. Hallelujah. My I've got a victory. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. It remind me of the church I ministered in, the, in Alabama, U.S. Uh, during the last convention. The whole place caught fire. Even myself. I, I said, now me they preach like this. <laughs> Before I say one word, somebody don't shout. They'll take it over from me. Hallelujah. It's good to be excited in the presence of the Lord. Not with all the tension in Nigeria. If you come to the house of the Lord and you have that tension again, where are you going to rejoice? Where are you going to rejoice? That's why David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because in his presence is fullness of God. And at his right hand is pleasure evermore. Somebody celebrate this God. Hallelujah. Give him a shout. Give him a shout. Give him a shout. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. You're welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Very quickly, let me take my scripture and then I'll pray and then I go on. Blessed to be a blessing, part two. Last week, I started on this message, blessed to be a blessing. And I said, when you're blessed, it's a command that you must be a blessing. It's not a choice. It's not a counsel. It's a command. The moment you're blessed, be looking for how to be a blessing. Hallelujah. So that's the theme. And we started last week by talking about the purpose of God's blessing. Because when purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. So we, we dwelt a lot on purpose that the rich fool missed the purpose of his blessing. When he had his bonds increase with harvest, he was asking himself, what will I do now? I would rather build more warehouse. He missed the purpose because the increase in his blessing was in, to enable him to serve and become a blessing to other people. Today, I'll be talking about the principles of God's blessing. Principles of God's blessing. Let me take the scripture, Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the law, it makes rich and it hardeth no sorrow with it. Genesis 12 verse 2, and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Let me turn to somebody and say you shall be a blessing. To your neighbor, you shall be a blessing. To your family, you shall be a blessing. To this nation, you shall be a blessing. To this church, you shall be a blessing. You shall be a blessing. Father, we thank you for this command. We give you praise because before commanding us to be a blessing, you already equipped us with what to use. Accept our thanks and our praises in Jesus' name. As we Examine your word this morning. We ask, Lord, that you speak to our hearts in the name of Jesus. The Bible said that Moses knew your ways, but the children of Israel only knew your acts. I ask, Lord, that as you expose to us the secret of ever-flowing and overflowing blessings, Father, that we we'll keep it in our hearts and we we'll apply it so that we can overflow with your blessings. Even this year of all our blessings. Thank you, Father, because you have had our prayers. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Thank you so much. You can have your seat. God bless you. I think it's the National Secretary who's been mentioning it, that uh, all our blessings is not a slogan. It should be a reality. And today, I'm going to share with you secrets that will make you experience all around blessing continuously flowing throughout this year and beyond. And that's where we are today. The principles that guide God's blessings. Last week we explained, we explored the purpose of God's blessings and concluded that it is to make us a blessing to others so as not to fall into the error of the rich fool. For every other blessing you have access to on earth, be it time, because some people have started asking, what is this blessing you are talking about? 
Your time is a blessing. Your time on earth is a blessing. Your treasure is a blessing. There's nobody that God has created who doesn't have any treasure at all. No, no. That's why when people pray that prayer, I don't agree. Say, God bless this offering. Bless those who have none. Ah, I said, no. How did they get here? They have something. They have something. So, your treasure is a blessing. Then, your talent is a blessing. Because nobody is useless before God. There is something you have with which to worship God. To bless others who are in, in need and to serve God and humanity. It was revealed in Abraham. Abraham became such a great blessing. The Bible says, and God had blessed Abraham in all things. It was revealed in Isaac. It became so great that Abimelech told him, you are too big for us. You are too great. It was revealed in Joseph. The Bible says, as soon as Joseph took over, managing Potiphar's resources, the Lord blessed Potiphar and all that he had, both in the house and in the field, for Joseph's sake. It was revealed in Jacob to the extent that Laban said, I have learned by experience that God has blessed me just because of you. So, it's a reality. And I pray it shall be a reality in your life. That God will not only give you all around blessing this year, he will make you a blessing. Where you walk, you'll be a blessing. In your home, you'll be a blessing. You know, somebody was so frustrated one day and he said, ah, cause be the day. A woman said, cause be the day I married my husband. You see, that, that shouldn't be. That's not God's purpose. God wants you to so be a blessing to your husband, to so be a blessing to your wife, that they will continue to thank God for that day. That thank God I didn't miss you. It should be a blessing. And you will be a blessing in the name of Jesus. Talking about the principles of God's blessing, we need to understand that God works by principles. Our God works by principle. That's why you woke up this morning. You didn't need to pray for the day to break. Did you? How many of you pray? You did fasting and prayer and say, God, let the day break. Let the No, 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 no. No. As long as the earth remains, that's God speaking. The moment he entered into that covenant with Noah, since that day, he has not broken it. So God works by principles. It's not like man. That's why number 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. So anything God says, if he lays the rule like this and you follow it, you get it. You get the result. God is not somebody who will say, today 2 plus 2 is 4. Then when you come tomorrow, he say, no, I've changed the rule. It's now 2 plus 2 is 6. No, no, that's not God. God is constant in his ways. No wonder the Bible says in Psalm 103 verse 7, he made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. Today, a lot of people are going about looking for the acts of God. When they should be looking for the ways of God. Because when you pursue his acts and you experience his acts, if you don't know his ways, you will not have the strength to hold the act. That's why some people's miracle disappear in their hand. Because they didn't learn the way. How do you retain it? It's not sufficient to get something. It's more important to know how to do what? How to retain it. Thank God you are going to be blessed this year. But how do you sustain it? How do you retain it? There's a prayer I normally pray for people whenever they're having celebration. I would say, this will not be the last thing you will celebrate. Because it has to be a flow. One celebration should give back to another one. One blessing should give back to another one. You shouldn't be giving old testimonies about what God did. Every day, the Bible said they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I pray that will be your experience this year in the name of Jesus. His ways are his principles. And principles are laws that are not discriminatory. Laws are not subject to change. Particularly laws and principles of God. As established in his word. That's why I said forever, O oh Lord. Your word is settled in heaven. Anywhere you go, so long as it's the word of God they are referring to, it won't change. It will be the same. It will be the same. He said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's principles and laws are rigid. And once they are obeyed, results are inevitable. What did I say? Once you obey, 
his rules, wants to obey, his charge, you obey, his commandments, his, the results are inevitable. It just comes automatically. So there, there's no special secret to it. So if you are still wondering, why are these people getting blessed? Well, how are they doing it? I'm just going to share it with you today. And I trust God that you have the faith to believe it and you'll be able to follow it in the name of Jesus. Like this year now is our year of all round blessings. So why, why should anybody not flow with blessing this year? Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 to 2. Look at, look at the condition he gave. And it shall come to pass. If you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command you today. So, the condition is stated. If, if you shall hearken diligently. I was doing my study and I discovered that there are about three or four types of promises in the Bible. One of them, of course, is conditional promises. But most of the time, when people want to read conditional promises, they are more interested in the results and the outcome. So sometimes, if they have the privilege, they will edit the condition away. Huh? You know, I normally quote these scriptures, which many people quote wrongly. Huh? The husband man shall be the first partaker of the fruits. Is that correct? It's not correct. But people have taken it to be correct. Most of the time, you hear people quote it. The husband man shall be the first partaker of the fruit. And they'll be praying, speaking in tongues. And they are fasting. The husband man must be the first partaker of the fruit. It's not correct. Though. What the Bible says is that the husband man that laboreth. So they've edited the laboreth away. So they have their own version of, the, of that verse of the scripture. Their own version does not include laboreth. And that laboreth is the key that opens the door to being a first partaker. So when you don't have the key, how do you enter? So there's, there are conditional promises in the Bible. And these all around blessings is one of them. It's not automatic. If anybody tells you it's automatic, it's not true. There are conditions attached to it. Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 2. Deuteronomy 28 happens to be one of the scriptures that we have as our theme for this year. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you. He repeated it again. If you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. He repeated the condition again. Once the above is obeyed, the result, which is all around blessing, is stated clearly. The world and its existence and operation is governed by principles and laws. For example, the law of gravity. The law of gravity says whatever goes up must come down. So no matter the level of your anointing, if you jump up, you will land on the floor. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter. You say, I'm so anointed. If I go up now, I will remain there. It's a lie. You are coming down because there's a law. The law of gravity. That reminds me of one man that they want to do baptism in the Holy Spirit for. And he was seeing people. As they lay hands on them, they went down. As they lay hands on them, he went down. Then he went to the back. He was watching. After a while, he said, yes, I'm ready now. I'm not going to fall. I've, I've, I've stabilized myself very well. And he did like this. And uh, when they lay hands on him, and he was say, he roared, he roared, he roared. He was on the floor. <laughs> he was on the floor. <laughs> because he has to obey the law. There, there's no way. Once it's a law established by God, there's no shortcut to it. You just have to comply. If you shall diligently act to the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do, the Lord will raise you up and make you to be high above all nations of the earth. And these blessings shall come on you and overtake you if you shall diligently akin to obey the voice of the Lord your God. So he kept repeating the condition. Because that's the key to entry into it. But you will not miss it this year. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. To sustain continuous flow of God's blessings into our lives, we must follow these principles. Number one, the principle of generosity. The principle of generosity. When I died, Tebuje was sharing it this morning. I thought he spied into my sermon note. 
Uh, but I know we don't live in the same house, so there's no way we can have access to it. The principle of generosity. Every blessing we have is expected to flow to others. Our God's own flows to us. Amen. Somebody told me, he said, the reason why they call it currency is because it's a currency. It's flowing around. So it must flow. That's how God's blessing is. You know, we normally sing a song. Praise ye the Lord from whom all blessings flow. So every blessing you see on earth came from God. And then from God to a man, and then he flows. All of us, as you are looking at me now, whatever blessings you have, the blessing of life, the blessing of time, the blessing of gifts, the blessing of treasure, came through somebody to you. Amen. So it came from God, and then God uses people to reach out to you. I, I saw this scripture, and it shocked me. I want you to listen to it. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7 to 8. For the earth, we drinks the rain that comes on it and brings herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receives blessing from God. Did you get that? The earth that receives rain. When it receives rain and bringeth forth herbs, useful herbs, meat for those who are dressing the land, we continue to be blessed by God. Did you see that? You are the earth. You are receiving rain from God. There are other people who are contributing one thing or the other into your life so that your life can progress. You see, so long as you continue to flow out, you too, you make it a point of duty to also flow out to other people. You will continue to be a recipient of the blessings from God. Did you understand it now? But look at the second verse. But that which beareth tongues and prayers is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose hand is to be bound. So, no flow. No flow. The one that receives and then grow into wild herbs that cannot be used. I pray for you today. May your generosity be useful to people around you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My, my grandmother, before she died, she grew very old. She used to say something. He said, when you kill chicken in your house, he said, even if it is all the water that you use to cook it, share it to your neighbors so that you can break the bone very well without fear. He said, because if you don't share it to your neighbor, you'll be afraid to break the bones when you are eating it. Because maybe your neighbor doesn't have any. He said, when you have shared, even if it's little, little, you share to them, then you'll be at liberty. At least you have announced to them that I'm eating chicken. That's how generosity is. People are not generous because they have more than enough. No. No. It's out of that one that God gave them that they're also giving out. Because some people make that mistake. When they see somebody who's so generous giving here, giving here, they say, ah, the man has plenty. In fact, somebody has spoken to me like that before. He said, ah, we knew you are loaded. You are loaded. I said, amen. Amen. I'm loaded from heaven. And my load is still in heaven. I'm drawing from there. He said, no, that's not what I mean. I said, I don't want to hear your explanation. This is my own explanation of it. Of your saying I'm loaded. So when you see people are generous, it's not necessarily that they are more than enough. It's just because they are obeying that rule. And you shall be a blessing generosity. And why should we be generous anyway? We have to remain generous and allow this blessing to keep flowing to others because this is how God operates. Our father is very generous. True of us. He gave his only begotten son. He has one son and he gave it out. That's a generous God. You serve a generous God. And when I read the scripture in Matthew 5.45, it said, that you may be the children of your father. So, any believer who is not generous, he say, but, I didn't call it to. I didn't call. Eh? Now, I hope you won't call him a fool, not me. Any Christian who is not generous, he say, but, I didn't finish it. You can say, Matthew 545, that you may be the children of your father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good 
and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Only a generous person will do this. Anybody who's not generous will not do that. He will discriminate. But because he's so generous, when he gave his only begotten son, who did he give it to? To the world. To the world. He didn't separate, say, okay, we want to pick those who are well behaved now. They are the ones who sacrifice the son for. Those who are not well behaved, I think they should go to hell straight. No opportunity for them to repent. He gave his only begotten son to the whole world. That's generosity. That's generosity. Some of our neighbors, they are just waiting for us to act generously, for them to come to Christ. They're just waiting for us to demonstrate love, to show generosity, for them to come to Christ. You know, we have a neighbor who is a Muslim, and the way we relate, you can't even know. You can't know. When they come to our house, we pray. Abi, when we are celebrating, we send something to them. When they're also celebrating, they send to us. Huh? I used to tell my husband, the way they say amen, self, you pass the one of Christians. Yes. That is out of generosity. That's how our God is. He doesn't discriminate. And that's the only way the blessing can keep flowing. Whether it's the blessing of life, whether it's the blessing of resources, whether it's the blessing of talent. Anything you don't use, you lose. That's the only way to keep it flowing. And this year, your blessing will overflow. In Psalm 145 verse 9, he said, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works, whether good or bad. He has mercy for all of them. We are equipped to be generous as children of God. It should be our nature to be generous with our time, with our talent, with our treasure. In Proverbs 11, 24, I'm going to read it in Amplified Version. I want you to listen to it in Amplified Version. He said, there is one who generously scatters abroad. Amplified. And yet, it increases all the more. And there is that we told us what is justly due, but results only in want and poverty. So, when you have, God expects you to be generous. Mommy used to follow up an elderly woman. She gave her life to Christ almost 70 years old. And then we were privileged, no, between 60 and 70, not really 70. And then we were privileged to be the one to follow her up. So she used to have a special time of prayer with mommy. You know, those are the kind of touch of follow-up that we don't have again. New converts, she has time. They have time together that they pray. And as God answers those prayers, her faith continues to grow. Because where she's coming from is very far. Somebody who has been to Abalis, who has been to... So you need to show them something to show that this is the way. So they used to pray together. And this is a sign of growth. In fact, being generous is a sign of growth in the Lord. So one day she came to our house at the time of prayer, according to her, and she was at the gate pressing the bell. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to her. He said, this person you are going to meet, you've been coming here for how many weeks now? Or how many months now? And each time you come, is your prayer request that you always pray over. He said, for a change today, when you get in and he, she asks you, what are your prayer requests? Tell her that you too, you want to pray for her own. That was growth. That was growth. And when she entered inside, mommy said, ah, let's thank God though for our lives. Then they thank God. After finishing, say, mommy, so as you are, what are your prayer requests? Say, I, I don't have any today. Oh, you, your own is your own. We pray for today. That is generosity. She has started learning it even as a convert. Not to me, 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 me. It's, it's, it's ungodly. It's ungodly. And that's what is destroying this country today. Selfishness. They don't care what happened to the next person. Huh? Like the sons of Zebede, the twins. He said, let one sit on the right and one on the left. I said, what happened to the other ten? They can disappear anywhere they like. Make they stay. Once we take care of my tire and my candy, we are fine. What of the others? A generous believer will not only be concerned about himself. Paul was lamenting in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. He said, I don't have anybody who can care for you. 
Say, I don't have, for I have no man like minded who will naturally care for your state. Verse 20. He said, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. That's one of the things dragging us back. It's one of the things dragging us back. And we pray and cry for blessing. And God is asking, What do you want to use it for? Just for yourself. Only yourself, myself. My son John, my wife Deborah, and my daughter Rose. That's all. In Jesus' name. Generosity. One of the men that God used to raise me up in the faith. He used to say something. I didn't believe him for a long time. He would tell me, he say, Sam, I don't have prayer requests. So. Ah. I say, how can a man exist in this world without prayer requests? He said, yes. I don't have prayer requests because the more I pray for other people, the more God answers my own prayer without praying it. It took me a long time to recognize it. That's a generous person. He will leave all his own concerns. It's not that he doesn't have problems. So. It doesn't, it's not that he doesn't have needs. So. But he said he has believed that as he prays for other people, God will solve his own problem. How did Joe's problem get solved? He was praying for his friends. I think Job should have locked himself up praying for himself. Abby, with the level of his problem and calamity. He, he, Job should not be somebody praying for anybody. Do, don't you agree with me? Uh, he should, in fact, he should declare 30 days and call the whole church to come and pray in his house because of the level of calamity. But Job didn't do that. What did he do? He was started praying for his friends. He was praying for his friend. And it was while praying for his friends, what happened? The Lord turned his captivity. I pray that as you make up your mind to be generous to people around you, may God cause all around blessing to flow in your direction continuously. Number two, the principle of reciprocity. Divine re reciprocity. Divine reciprocity. When you bless others, God takes care of your needs. There is almost nothing that God won't do for the person who really wants to help others. One of the things that has slowed down the gospel, let me be frank with you, is our lack of interest in other people. In those days, even in your office, as a Christian, the first thing is not to say, I want to preach Christ to you. No. No, that's a wrong approach. And that's why today the gospel is not moving fast because we're more interested in downloading John 3.16. Uh, which one again? Just load them. Romans 10.13. No, that's not it. That's not it. When Jesus met the woman at the well, did he start with, uh, uh, you need to be born again? No, 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 no. He started by attacking the woman's need. There's no woman being in this world that you meet, whether high, medium, or low. And the first thing you talk about is their need. Who will not be interested in what you are saying? Huh? They'll be interested. Naturally interested. You come to me and you hit at what is my greatest need. Ah, I will listen to you. I will listen to you. Ah, this person has a solution. And that's one of the things that is changing the gospel today. We don't address people's needs. We feel that the only need they have is Christ. No, they is, I agree with you. But you should address it the way they understand. That way you are going. They don't understand it. Because that's the spiritual way. You speak to a man in the language he understands. If I'm a Yoruba man, I don't understand English. And you come, you start speaking Igbo to me. You, are you not wasting your time? Because I'll just look at you and he's... He said, look at this young man, he's talking to me. Or oh, you are Igbo. And somebody came and started talking bati, bati. You won't understand what he's saying. That's exactly how the manner of approach of the gospel is today. It's the need that you should attack. Why do you think churches that focus on young people are growing faster than the other churches? It's because they focus on their needs. That's the reason. Every human being has a need. So when you focus on people's need, naturally, they will respond. God is calling us that we must focus on other people's need. There is a guarantee that if you make it, a, a, you make it 
you know, your habit to bless others, your needs are met. Last week we read Psalm 41, verse 1 to 3 extensively. We said, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in trouble. We say, Who is the poor? The poor is somebody who has a need. So if somebody is not saved, he has a spiritual need. If somebody is sick, he has a health need. So blessed is that fellow who make it a point of duty to pay attention to other people's need. What happened to him? He said, the Lord will deliver him in trouble. The Lord will preserve him. Secondly, and he shall be blessed in the earth. Is that not what we are looking for? Blessing. He shall be blessed in the earth. And you will deliver him, not him, unto the will of his enemies. I love this scripture so much. Verse 3 said, The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. You will make all his bed in sickness. So God will ensure that that person, when he's sick, God will heal him. Do you know that there are people, if anything should happen to them, there are so many people that will go for it. Some people will die just hearing that the man is dead. Some, some will die. Because their life is tied to the person. You know, I have two people that I know. Every month they have a payroll for widows. Every month. Oh, how many people do you think are praying for that person? Everybody on that payroll will pray. Oh. It's not that they are a staff. Oh. He just has a payroll for widows. One of my friends worked with the person. When he started his own business, he now told me, he said, this is one of the things I learned. You know, some people, when they go to a place, they only learn the thing that will make them fatter. He learned something about what to give. So he said, so, a man of God, me too, I have payroll for people that I pay every month. Go and check anybody who oppressed by that principle. They are always increasing. Because they are helping God to meet the needs of people. So they will, God will ask you, your own, what do you think you want to can do? Only for me, my son Joseph, my wife Rose, and my daughter Elizabeth. So God is not interested in such. God is interested in people who will assist him. Look at it again. In Job 29 verse 12, he said, Because I delivered the poor that cried. Did you see it? Because I delivered the poor that cried. And the fatherless, and him that had none to help him. Can you see the description of the people he went to? He went to help the poor that cried, the fatherless, and the one that has nobody to help him. Look at what happened in verse twelve. The, the blessing of thirteen. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart. To sing for joy. You, you, know, you know how? Because the blessing of the one that was perished, was ready to perish, came upon him. He continued again and started making widows to sing for joy. May you not lose your place in the name of Jesus. There's a vacancy for people who want to occupy this kind of place. Always vacancy there. And once you step into it, heaven will begin to provide resources. Because it's not, your, it's not you. It's not about you. It's about the owner of the assignment. It's God. The Bible says he is merciful to all his work. So he is looking for hands to use. God cannot come down again. He said the poor that cried. He, no matter how much the poor cried, he still needs somebody. God needs somebody to go and meet that cry. May you be found in the name of Jesus. I say may you be found in the name of Jesus. When you care about other people, God assures God assumes responsibility for your problems. And that is the real blessing. Because when God decides to take over your problem, will it not be solved? It will be solved. That's why I say God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. That's usually my prayer. I say God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. There are so many things I can't do for myself. Just these bits that he asks us to do for him. Taking care of the poor. Being used to reach the needy. Needy spiritually, needy health-wise, needy financially. He wants to use us to reach them so that himself can now be the source of our own solution. That's, what, that's the secret to overflowing blessing. 
You know, there was uh, this story. I think I've shared it with her before. Suda Singh, who was uh, a missionary, and he was going on Monte Himalayas with his partner in the snow. And then when they got halfway into Monte Himalayas, they came across a man who was shivering in the cold. The man was almost freezing. So Suda Singh told his friend, he said, can't we pick this man? Let him be our third person. Ah! The partner said, no, if you pick him, you see that he is already frozen. We are warm. When you pick him and you add him to us, three of us will freeze, oh. Me, I don't want to die, oh. That's what his partner told him. So, so that thing, because he's operating by God's principle of meeting the needs of the needy so that God can meet your own need. You know what he said? He said, you can go. I'll carry him. So Sudha Singh asked his partner to be going. And of course, he was faster because he's warm and he's alone. So he moved faster. So he now carried this man who is frozen at his back. And as he carried the man at his back, of course, he couldn't move fast. And the man began to defrost. You know that? Because he's warm. The man was defrozen. Water everywhere was defrozen. But as slow as they walked, after a while, the man also became warm. And both of them now were going. You know what they found? His partner that left him, they found him frozen and dead. That's what selfishness can cause. That's what selfishness can cause. There's a saying that people say, they say, you who is alone, die alone. Uh, have you heard it before? Anybody that is alone, dies alone. No? Jump alone, die alone. <laughs> he applies salsa to it. <laughs> He was dead. True life story. He was completely dead. He had frozen and dead. He didn't know that the reason was one before was because there were two. And he didn't want to help another person. There are so many people who have lost their blessings because of refusing to be a blessing to others. But in this year of all round blessings, that will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Number three, the principle of harvest. The principle of harvest. Genesis 8.22 While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Every harvest is preceded by a sowing time. Whatever harvest you have today is possible by your sowing of yesterday. So whatever God has put in your hand is a seed. Like I, I used to say, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, chapter 9, you will hear what God, what God was saying there. When he was saying in verse 10, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10, Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister seed for your food and multiply your seed, minister bread for your food and seed, and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So for every blessing that come your way, your time, your talent, your treasure, they are a combination of two things. What and what? The seed and the bread. So the seed you are expected to do what with? To sow. And the bread you are expected to eat. But unfortunately, many people used their seed as butter on top of their bread. And they ate everything. And when a farmer has eaten his seed, during harvest, he has nothing. Because he will not be able to plant. When we were growing up, I discovered that the, the yam seed is specially sweet. Oh. Very sweet. Have you tasted it before? Yam seed. Very sweet. That's why they keep it in the, in the roof where children cannot easily reach it. Very sweet. So some of us who are very rascally those days, we go and look for ladder. We climb it. We go and take. When you burn it and you eat it, kai, 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 kai. I say it's temptation so that there will be no future. And so many people have been tempted. The seed they are supposed to sow, the temptation is sweeter than the normal yam. If you taste it, it's sweeter than the normal yam. So that they won't have future. Because the moment you eat the seed yam, when people are planting, what will you plant? No 
nothing. You have already eaten the future. And the way God has ordained this principle is that there will only be seed time and harvest. So if you don't participate during the seed time and you are expecting harvest, is it not deception? It's deception. Look at Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. He said, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And in verse 9, he said, and let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall do what? Repeat. If we faint not. Life is all about sowing and reaping. That's the truth. Life is all about what? Sowing and reaping. There are people who have refused to sow for one reason or the other, and they regret it later. I've shared the testimony of one of my friends here who was, when, when he was finishing secondary school, like this was when he accepted Christ. And after accepting Christ, the father said, because of this, your newfound faith, I have no business with you. And he was very intelligent, very smart. And he got admission to read mercy at that time. And the father said, no, never. With this your faith? No. I won't train you. And he, had, and he went. He came to school. He was just, he would stay with brethren. You know, in the fellowship, we share tickets. We do everything gently. He will go and sit with a medical student. He will read their book when they are sleeping. When they wake up, he will return their book to them. How he read medicine without a sponsor, only God knows. But the day he was going to graduate, they gave him two cards. Abby, for convocation. He took one and took it to his father. So that day, the man began to shed tears. He said, what? How did you do it? He said, my God, that he said I should not serve is the one that did it for me. And the man was regretting because the time he was supposed to sow in his life, he didn't sow. Now he can see harvest coming. That's why nobody should shack his responsibility. I was talking to men on Friday night. I said, don't shack your responsibility. Once you shack your responsibility, God will go and bless your neighbor who is ready to take it up. Sowing and reaping, that's how life is all about. I thank God for the money manner we share this morning. If you, all you are sowing is thorns, all you are sowing is bad attitude, all you are sowing is bad behavior, people will be wondering, say, maybe they say this one is a Christian. And you are expecting people to act normal to you. You know, ironically, you saw people who will expect you to be too nice to them. When you are not nice to them, they be the one to ask you, say, ah, why are you not nice? Meanwhile, himself is not nice. So <laughs> have forgotten that. Sowing gives birth to harvest. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow, that's what he will reap. Today, you will see like this church now giving birth to a youth church. You know, some people will say, ah, why, why should we do that? But do you know, he's so, you know, he's so, in. let me give you an example. When we were in Edim for Refreshing Fiji, the day I told my colleagues that I'm going to decentralize Lagos from Edim, they look at me. They say, am I normal at all? I say, no, the law of sowing and reaping, what you sow is what brings harvest. The one you keep doesn't. So I said, let's break it into uh, uh, Badagri, Kurudu, and uh, Leki. They look at me. When we did the first one, the whole auditorium was empty. I started getting phone calls. We told you before, you know, they hear, God said, you know, they, I said, God is he saying, he has not... He has not reversed what he said. This January, to the glory of God, people from abroad were asking, Shebi, you said some people are in Nikorudu. Shebi, you said, this place is overflowing. What happened? I said, nah, God. Even me, I don't understand. And yet, Nikorudu was filled. Baragri was filled. And so, supposing that we kept to ourselves in Edim, we will still remain there. And we will be praising ourselves. Say, ah, we grow, we grow. So until you sow, you don't harvest. You must be ready to part with it. 
And it's painful, though, because the seed yam is the sweetest. As I'm rounding up this message, I think I've shared the story of Alexander Fleming with us before. The young man who was with other youths. They were together with other youths and um, you know, the father of um, the father of Winston Churchill, Randolph Churchill, went on a campaign. And when he was returning, his cat, because those days they don't use car, it was a cat, got stuck. And Alexander Fleming was among the other youths who came to pull out the cat. And when they had pulled it out, you know, naturally for a politician who was going on campaign, there's money to throw around. He called Alex Sander Fleming and said, can I give you some cash? And the young boy said, no, I don't need it. He said, what I need? I want to be a doctor. And I'm looking for somebody who will sponsor me. Because my parents are poor. And we see church, uh, church, um, not we see church, the father, the father of we see church, he said, look, don't worry. When I get back to base, I'll make sure I arrange for it. And he went back to base. He sponsored him to medical school. And um, 50 years later, 50 years later, this young man had become a consultant and he had done the research and discovered penicillin as a solution to disease of anemia. And what happened? The son <laughs> of the man that sent him to school had become the leader in Europe. And at the time when he was doing well and providing solution to the nation was when this same disease hit him and he was going to die. It was the penicillin that was discovered by Alexander Fleming sent to medical school by his father that was used to heal him. So when he was sponsoring him to school, he didn't know he was healing his own son. That's how it happens. Many people are harvesting today what maybe their fathers or their grandfathers sowed, whether good or bad. That's why you yourself, you have to be careful what you're sowing because you may not be the one to harvest it. Your generation of bomb may have to harvest it. That's why. Because the law of sowing and reaping, anointing doesn't cancel it. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow, that's what he will reap. Anointing doesn't cancel it. Grace does not cancel it. What you sow is what you reap. That's why you have to be careful. Finally, as a random, the principle of stewardship. That should be simple for anybody. The more God blesses you, the more he expects you to bless others. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, he said, who make you to differ from another? And what do you have that you, have, you did not receive? Now, if you receive it, why do you glory as if you do not receive it? We must bless others with what we are given as good stewards of God's blessings. Luke 12, 48. Much is required from the person to whom much more is given, much more is required. In Romans chapter 14, verse 12. So then, every one of us, how many of us? How many of us? Only the pastor, so. Eh? Only the pastor, so. Only Dicky, so. Now only Arupio. Eh? Only Gio. That verse is funny to only Gio. Only Arupi. Only Arupi. We answer for this one. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You are a steward. A steward of your time. A steward of your resources. A steward of your talent. A steward of opportunities that comes your way. Are you going to use it for the glory of God? Or you are going to use it to propagate yourself? You are a steward. A day is coming. You will give account. You will give account. That man that gave his servants talents. Five to one. The Bible says... I'm so interested in this. After a long time, no matter how long, the time will come to an end. And you will give account. As a man who is the head of a family, you will give account. As a leader leading a department, you will give account. 
as somebody that God has blessed, you will give account of yourself to God. That's why we must be good stewards of God's blessings. If he has blessed you, the least you can do is to be faithful as a steward. As we obey these four principles, I see you overflowing in blessings this year. I say your blessings will overflow this year. The principle of generosity, be generous. Be generous both to the good and the bad. Be generous. The principle of divine reciprocity. As God is good to you, you to be good to somebody else. And as you are good to somebody else, more will come. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The principle of harvest. Whatsoever a man sow, that he will reap. And finally, the principle of stewardship. All of us, every one of us, we give account of himself to God. And as we bear this in mind, I trust God, as we all pray these principles, our lives will never remain the same. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to bow down our heads to pray. If you are there, the best gift is the gift of your life. Because your life is everything you have. It's your time. It's your treasure. It's your talent. That's your life. It's the best you can give to God. And you've heard, you must give account, whether you like it or not. Every one of us must give account of ourselves to God. Of what was done in our lives. We must give account of ourselves to God. And you are there today. And you're saying, Lord, ah, I didn't know it's like this. So, ah, then I need to commit myself to God afresh. So that you can help me. That I will not be an unfaithful steward. So that my life, he said, after death is judgment. Every one of us, every one of us must give account of ourselves to God. If you are there, you are saying, Lord Jesus, I'd like to, I'd like to recommit myself to you. To be faithful steward of my life. You see, you have been bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Have you been glorifying God in your life? Or have you been doing self-glorification? How relevant are you to God's program? How relevant are you to eternal program? With the blessings with which God has blessed you. I'm going to pray for you today. And the blessing of God for this year will overflow around you. The blessing of God will overshadow you and overtake you. In the name of the Lord Jesus. But if you are there, you are saying, Lord Jesus... I want to commit my life to you afresh. I want to, Lord, I want to submit myself to you to make you the Lord and master of my life so that I can use my time, I can use my talent, I can use my treasure for you and you alone. Anywhere you are, under the sound of my voice, on radio, on television, I'd like you to put your right hand on your chest. I want to pray for you. We're going to pray together right now. We're going to pray together right now. Anywhere you are, just put your hand on your chest. The Lord wants to receive you and give you a new mandate. A new mandate as somebody that he has shown mercy to. I want you to just put your right hand, put your right hand on your chest and we're going to pray together. We're praying together right now. We're praying together right now. Anywhere you are, just put your right hand on your chest. We're praying together. We're praying together. And if you are there in this auditorium, I'd like you to just, just raise your hand where you are so that I can, I can recognize you as I pray for you. Just raise your hand right there where you are. Right there where you are. Raise your hand up so that I can recognize you and pray with you. Father, in the name, God bless you. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this word that you have sent to us. On the need for us, to be like our Heavenly Father who is generous on the need for us to meet the need of others so that our needs can be met. On the need for us to be good stewards of all that you have endowed us with. Lord, we pray you will accept our thanks and our praises in Jesus' name. 
Thank you for these ones who are making a fresh commitment unto you. I ask Lord that you receive them to yourself in the name of Jesus. Cause their names to be written in the Lamb's book of life in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, show them mercy in the name of the Lord Jesus. And let your name and your name alone continue to be glorified in their lives. Thank you, Father, because you have had our prayers. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. This year shall be your year of all and blessings. Your blessings will overflow in the name of Jesus Christ. Every grace, every help you need to be good stewards of God's resources. Receive that grace in the name of the Lord Jesus. Before I round up my prayer, there are people here. You know what to do, but you struggle. You struggle to do it. You see needs. You want to meet it. And you have what it takes to meet it. But you keep struggling. The Lord asked me to pray for you. He asked me to pray for you for grace. In the Bible told us of the story of the church of Macedonia. That they had extra grace. That even in their deep, deep poverty, they were generous. And that's why their blessing continued to overflow. You need grace. Grace to spend your time for kingdom purpose. Grace to spend your resources for kingdom purpose. Grace to spend your talent for kingdom advancement. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want us all to rise up on our feet. As I round up my prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that we have heard. We pray today that this word will not stand against us in the name of Jesus. As we have heard this word, we shall not be hearers only, but doers of your word in the name of our Lord Jesus. And as you spoke to me, I release grace upon your people. Grace to be good stewards of your resources. Grace to be a blessing to their neighbors. Grace to be a blessing to their families. Grace to be a blessing to their children. Grace to be a blessing to where they walk. I release that grace upon them in the name of Jesus. Grace to be a blessing to the church of God. Grace to be a blessing to the unbelieving world. Thank you because you have had our prayers. In Jesus' name we have prayed.